Welcome to the family who builds. My name's Don. Typically, the houses built here in the Midwest are built on some kind of foundation. The foundations can be reinforced concrete, block, or even a combination of the two. The foundations might be full ceiling height that allows for extra living space below ground. They also might be a crawl space and have just a few feet of space between the ground and the subfloor. They also might be like this one, short walls with a concrete slab floor. Let's talk a minute about this concrete foundation. It starts with our climate. Our climate has four definite seasons and we experience frost and freeze. For this reason, the foundations in this area must extend below the frost line. This helps reduce the upward movement that happens when the ground freezes during the winter months. Stopping this movement is critical. This upward movement can quickly break the foundation footings and walls. Let's consider this. Building houses with concrete started thousands of years ago when the Egyptians used an early form of gypsum concrete mortar. They used this mortar to actually build the pyramids. The Romans, as well as the Greeks, made a large advancement in the use of concrete. They began using concrete beyond just a mortar mixture between the stones and began using it to build entire buildings that still stand to this day. This includes Roman harbors for trade, aqueducts to transport water, and the awe-inspiring Colosseum. The concrete of ancient times had a different mixture than today's concrete. Roman concrete used volcanic ash and volcanic stones, and this extended the life of the material. The addition of these two items extended the concrete's life thousands of years past the life of modern day concrete. Now with the fall of the Roman Empire, concrete wasn't used much for nearly 1400 years. This leads us to present day. Some modern day advancements like steel reinforcement makes concrete our most used building material on the face of the earth. The availability of concrete has made it easier and easier for us to find new uses from roads to bridges to even skyscrapers. We see it everywhere. Well, this foundation is one of those new uses. What we have here is a steel reinforced concrete footing with a steel reinforced poured concrete wall. And this makes the foundation amazingly stable and strong. After the new foundation was poured, the concrete forms were stripped. And the newly poured foundation was filled with clean rock that was delivered via dump truck from the local quarry. The plumbing company came shortly after and installed all the under slab water and sewer lines. Next, the flat workers poured the concrete floor. And now it's our turn. We are here to frame this house. We walked around the foundation and chipped the excess concrete from the bolts and the top of the concrete walls. We used a leaf blower and we cleaned the chipped concrete off the floor. At this point, we're pretty much ready to start framing. Keep in mind, these walls are held to the foundation by bolts. These bolts were installed when the foundation was poured and extend about 12 inches down into the poured foundation wall. Concrete does hold moisture, so we use a rot-resistant board that slows the process of wood decay. This board has to be drilled to match those bolts. We also use a foam barrier between the foundation and the rot-resistant board. This helps seal the board to the foundation and it helps close any air gaps. Once we make a few of these changes, we basically build the walls like we would for any other house. So here we go. We've already started building the walls. As you can see, the back wall has started going together as well as the front wall. We have several windows to frame in, so let's listen to a song while we build these things. Sit back, stay with us. Oh, and please subscribe, hit the like button, and drop me a comment. It really helps grow the channel, and you do make a difference. Just keep us.
sun from your eyes and stay by my side. I'll be ready when the war comes to the Something so strong Like everything you do is wrong Eyes wanna explode Scream out of control So let's take a look at how all this works. It's important to think of this as a building system. We have several components that all work together to give the house the strength that it needs to withstand the elements. The bottom plate sits and bolts to the foundation. That's that rot resistant board that we talked about earlier. The stud connects the top plate to the bottom plate. The trusses sit on those top plates and that makes the inside ceiling of the house. Over the top of the windows and doors, we have a header. These headers are sized for the amount of weight they're going to carry. The more roof load or amount of stories, maybe even the size of the window or door, all this can change the thickness and size of that header. See, the purpose of this header is to move the weight around the window or door. This is important, and without it, the system would fail. Have you ever seen a door that stops closing as it should, or maybe a crack in the drywall that goes from the corner of the door to the ceiling. This sometimes happens. Most of the time it's related to settling or movement, but it could be from an undersized header, especially in areas where inspections just aren't required. In the area that we are in, we mostly use OSB and we fully sheathe the house. In some areas, you're allowed to put OSB or plywood on an outside corner and use some sort of other structural panel or a T-brace to hold the wall square. In our area, that does exist in the local building codes, but as builders, we choose to fully sheathe the walls as, as more of a preferred building method. I personally feel like it's just stronger and makes a better home. Now, once the OSB is installed, 
we wrap the walls with house wrap. That provides the vapor barrier and a small amount of protection until the siding is installed. When the walls are turned up and bolted down, they make a corner. Whether it's an outside or inside corner, those corners are tied together with an overlapping top plate, and then the studs are nailed together. That creates the strength that the house needs to resist some of the forces that it's going to experience. For example, maybe wind, uplift, and possibly even seismic. This system of building took hold as hardwood timber became more expensive and less available. This happened sometimes in the early 1830s and has been refined ever since. It seems like we see new products every year and some of these products are changing the industry. For example, asphalt shingles replaced slate and metal roofs. Vinyl siding replaced hardwood plank siding. Aluminum gutters replaced copper gutters. Vinyl flooring replaced hardwood and natural stone tile. The industry is constantly changing and evolving, and I think we're just getting started. So let's go over a few things that you're seeing. We just snapped out the floor, and that's going to tell us where these interior walls actually meet the exterior wall. Have you noticed the pipes in the floor? Yep, they're in the way. We're going to have to install our walls around those pipes. See, the plumber installed those pipes before the concrete floor was poured. The goal is to put those pipes in the walls that we are building. This puts them behind drywall, out of sight, and away from damage. Now, sometimes we have to move walls and adjust the location of our walls around those pipes. I've seen plumbing pipes that are just too far away from the spot where they're supposed to be. Unfortunately, the plumber might have to move the pipe and this involves breaking the concrete out and moving the pipe, and then re-pouring that section of the concrete floor. It's a big, expensive, messy job. Now, as you can see, we're gonna connect the inside walls to the outside walls. There's lots of different ways to do this. You can make a corner that uses one stud turned flat and nailed to another stud on its edge. It looks like an L. That corner is what we consider a California corner. Sometimes we make a U using three studs. We call them wall blocks. This particular builder has asked us to use ladder blocks and that's what we're doing here. We measure down from the top plate approximately four feet. That's the center of our center block. We know that the interior drywall will have a seam in this location within half the distance again and that's our other two blocks. That's what this owner has specced. This allows them to insulate behind the corner of the wall and it does provide the best R value. So, as you can see, we started building the interior walls. This creates the rooms inside of the house. These rooms need doors and we frame them the exact way that we build the exterior walls. The only difference is these walls are not load bearing and they won't get sheeted. The walls do not require load bearing headers either. As soon as we build a wall, we stand it up against the exterior wall and move it out of the way. This is something we work out before we even start building the interior walls. This allows us to have the space that we need to keep building. See, the more walls that are built, the less room we have to build the remaining walls. If we build walls out of order, we might be just like painting ourselves into a corner and we'll just most likely run out of room. Now. We have very tight schedules and our framing jobs are bid for a set amount of labor hours. My goal as an owner is to hit those exact hours. If we are ahead of schedule, I prefer to slow the work down or leave early. If we are behind, I prefer to speed it up or stay late. Finding that steady, constant, sustainable pace, that's my goal. Well, we've just about reached the end of our day. Let's recap our first day on the job. We chipped the excess concrete from the foundation. This step is not typical and delayed the start of the project. This caused a delay of three labor hours and will be added as an extra cost to the billing. It also puts us behind schedule. Now, we built the main exterior walls and started the interior walls. We're going to put our tools up and come back tomorrow and finish up this part of the job.
Well, we're back. I hope you're enjoying the video. Please don't forget to help us out and hit the subscribe button. And liking the video does help out the channel as well. Also, if you have the time, please take just a minute and comment on the video. Maybe you want to see something. You never know. We might be able to make a video just for you. Well, we built as many walls as we can. It's time to install the walls. We need to move them into place and nail the corners together. After that, it's time to shoot them down to the concrete so they won't move. We started installing the walls away from the camera and move towards the camera. That gives us the room that we need to build the remaining walls. Now our plan is to build the exterior garage walls next. Uh, we need a place to build those garage walls. We decided to leave the common divider wall out until very last. See, when the material was delivered for this house, the entire lumber package was delivered. The camera is actually sitting on top of all the roof sheeting, and unfortunately, it's in the way of the garage walls. This is not a big deal. We'll build the walls in the living room, carry them over to the garage, and install them. We'll do this for every wall, including the wall with the garage door opening. After all the garage walls are built, we'll build that dividing wall. Easy. Well, we've got the garage walls built. They are all done and ready to sheet. Right now, we're taking the opportunity to build that common divider wall. 
We'll build it real quick, stand it up, and then we'll sheet those garage walls. Thank you.